Uh, it's the boy Blackbeard Mirage on Bat. What's going on? What's happening? All the viewers out there in the Mirage universe, it's time for another classic. But today we're going to have a specialized episode and bring in another guest so we can get a uh, outside view to kind of clarify some history, um, some just personal experiences and, and, and make concrete, you know, um, substance out of a lot of stuff we've been talking about on the tapes. You know, we talk about a lot of Moorish and Aboriginal history and stuff like that, but you know, every now and then we want to bring somebody from the outside world that could even, you know, give personal testimony to um, a lot of stuff that we're saying and show the similarities in cultures. So what we're going to do in this tape is, is we're going to talk about um, some Moorish history and show the connection between the Spanish speaking Aboriginals in Central and South America, known as so-called Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, um, et cetera. You know, the people in so-called Brazil, Peru, whatever. And just show how, you know, these Spanish speaking Aboriginal copper colored, bronze colored people um, or even some of the fair skinned people, although they may speak Spanish, they really are no different than the Aboriginal Moors from North America who may speak English. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, the different trades that were going on in Southern Europe and how, you know, the Moors of North America and Central and South America were trading once again with these Moors off the coast of West Africa and these Moors from Southern Europe. Um, and then, you know, so we're going to just connect a lot of that stuff and then we're going to let the guests, you know, give us a lot of his personal insights, you know, from just his personal experiences in history um, and, and just bring all that stuff together, you know. So that's what the whole point of this tape is, is to get a greater expansion and understanding of history, uh, personal experience, hypocrisy um, it's in real reality, because the guest we have is, is from, you know, um, he, he has a, a very, very broad heritage, you know, and I'm going to let the brother explain it himself. But either way it goes, you know, although a lot of the Aboriginal people on the planet look different and we come from different backgrounds, um, we have to basically look at what people choose to identify themselves as and bring them in the fold. So, for example, we have even a certain paradigm going on right now with so-called mixed or mulatto people um, and, and them feeling kind of cornered, you know, uh, which side of the heritage do they feel more um, leaning towards is it their more side or is it their you know so-called Caucasian side we basically will talk about a lot of that to help you know clear that confusion up with some people um, and just lay a lot out on the table so the first thing is we're gonna just let the guest briefly introduce himself and then after that I'll go into some brief history you know going between Spain and the Americas so real quick we're gonna let the um, guest just kind of introduce himself you know give y'all a brief little introduction and you know get yeah. us ready so yeah, my name is Bell. Um, I was born in New York, in Brooklyn. Parents come from the American Republic, first generation American. Um, I'm fair. I have color in my skin. You know, I consider myself African. And my parents don't feel the same. Well, the culture in, in the American Republic doesn't feel the same. My father is uh, was was raised, and he was a blonde. He had blonde hair, blue eyes. My mom in the mountains, and my mom was in the town. And she owned most of the land, but her grandfather and she is fair skinned. And my father, my grandfather is dark, very, very complex. And yeah, that's um, my history on my parents. And um, I just never felt like um, I fell in with the Spanish um, cold side of my family, but I always felt a connection with my African. You know, I always felt I always felt black. Like I never felt like I never felt like in New York. That's you know that's how we talk. I guess you know I don't want to come off. But um, yeah, um, I consider like I never considered my, like I don't tell people I tell people I'm Dominican, but I'm black. Mm -hmm. I, I consider myself African. Like, mm -hmm. I'm African Dominican, Dominican African, whatever it goes, however it goes. Right. And um, it's just yeah, um, like you were saying, there's a lot of hypocrisy um, that I've you know I've I've experienced with my own eyes. Um, and I just growing up and experience um, experiencing shit. Um, you know. I feel disconnected with, you know, also with the, with the African, you know, African Americans or the Moors, you know, we want to call them Moors, you know, right. still using Moors more. Right. Um, they also didn't really accept me all the time because I came from a Spanish culture, so it was different. It was it was it was hard for them to consider me one of them when I can just. They felt like I can just switch it up and speak Spanish and talk shit. You know? Right, right. That's how it. That's how it felt, you know. And so they never really took me, and they always felt like they had to like bully me, like you know. I never, I was never bullied, like you know. 
but they always try to toe down on me, you know, and, you know, it, right. sometimes it got physical, but I had to just show them that, nah, I'm not just in the middle, I might not be as, you know, my color might not be as dark as yours, but I definitely feel who you are, and I feel all the, all the, all the pain and all the glory that you feel the same way, I, like, that same way as you, I'm not different, right. you know, like, I don't consider myself, you know, people in my country want to consider themselves, or want to go with the side of the Caucasian man, and that's not really how I feel the country should go, if it wants to progress. Right. So that's really why I want to talk about this, you know, but, you know, we can get to all the morals. Right, right, okay. All right, that's good. That's a real, real good breakdown and um, brief introduction. So what we're going to do now is, is we're going to show the connection between, like I said, um, Florida, Central and South America, uh, and S Spain, or the so-called North, and Portugal, rather, mm -hmm. and yeah. Italy, you know, and hold the whole Southern Europe, so-called area. Now, a lot of us know about the Moorish history of, you know, 7-Eleven, when they talk about these Moors of um, darker bronze, melanated tone, who were practicing Islam and speaking Arabic and, and really a, a variety of other Arabic languages. When they went into Southern Europe and basically um, fought off a lot of those, we'll say Neanderthal um, descended hominid um, vandals, as they would say, or Visigoths, and they established a lot of the you know Islamic empires that we know of. Uh, one of them even being the Ottoman Empire, part of these Moors. But what a lot of people don't know is is that the Moors that went into Europa, not all of these Moors didn't come from the Middle East, the so-called Levant, or so-called East Africa. Some of these Moors even were coming from the Americas. Because, as I've talked about in previous tapes, they have found different, um, we'll say, stones and tablets with ancient Arabic languages here in the Americas, in Nevada in particular, as I talked about on one tape. They have found ancient tablets with Hebrew, Phoenician, and ancient Latin writings here in the Americas. So what you see is is that the cultures in, you know, the Mediterranean or Southern Europe are also being, you know, reflected here in the Americas. Um, another example is in Fort Benning, Georgia, they found tablets with Minoan writing on them. And Minoan writing is basically a language by people who were, you know, in the so-called Mediterranean Sea. So here you have the same languages in Georgia are being spoken in you know, the Mediterranean Sea as well. Uh, man, excuse me, we had to just do a brief pause for a minute, but um, basically what we were saying is that, you know, all throughout the Americas, you have the same Aramaic languages that were spoken in Southern Europe um, or the Mediterranean Sea, North Africa, they were being spoken here in the Americas as well because there were trades going on. Um, and a lot of this information can be found in Barry Fell's books, um, America BC and Saga America, who's basically a professor out of Harvard. I've already referenced that on a few tapes and other tapes I've given sources. So, you know, you just have this, this connection between the Spanish Latin Moors and the Americas. Because what we don't know is, is that the original, let's say, Catholic Church even of so-called Spain, these were Moors, dark-skinned people. Um, and there were even popes in, in Europe that were Moors or so-called dark-skinned people. Um, we are very, very aware of this. And even the original um, cardinals and the whole concept that you see in Italy and the Vatican and stuff like that, you know, these were all dark-skinned Moors and people, you know, that look just like the so-called American blacks. So, you know, there has always been a trade going on between uh, the Americas and, you know, um, in, 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 in Southern Europe. That is why when you had the Spanish Inquisition in about 14, late 1400s, early 1500s, when the Catholic Caucasians came in, um, more preferably the, you know, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, red-haired Caucasians who were practicing Christianity, when they came in and took over, you know, a lot of the Moorish territories in Southern Europe, they, you know, from their Inquisitionist um, torture devices, learned the different trades learn the different uh, maps and navigations and, and waterways to the Americas because once again the Spanish speaking Latin Moors were already dealing with the Moors in Central Americas, the Puerto Ricans, um, you know, and the different Aboriginal tribes of Central America. So this is when you have now an invasion 
of the Spanish forces. That's why when you look into the early American um, history, you will see that the first European so-called colonizers were the, were the Spaniards. Um, the English and some of these other people, they didn't come to much later, but the earlier you know, people were the, the Spaniards, um, i.e. the so-called Christopher Columbus story, which really could all be a Freemasonic um, symbol and code for just, you know, the amalgamated, we'll say, um, Caucasians invading into the Americas. So, you know, part of that invasion that the um, Caucasian Christian church came with is, you know, creating more of a Tower of Babel-like situation. And we talked about the Tower of Babel on a previous tape, but basically what that is, is, is because you have these people who look different and are speaking different languages, although they are the same people. And when I say look different, meaning by variation in skin tone or variation in melanin, being from very, very dark skinned um, to, let's say, so-called copper or bronze skinned to, let's say, more lighter skinned, you know, all the way to where the person may even look so-called Caucasian, but they still are an Aboriginal or more. So taking that and taking also into consideration that these people are speaking different languages, the Christian Catholic Church took advantage of that. And we are still seeing the remnant of that to this day. So what I want to talk about right now is, is we're going to let the guests kind of talk about the diversity of where he grew up in New York, um, the different cultures that were, you know, around, um, you know, how did these cultures interact with each other? Who, who owned really majority of the property um, and just basically what he what it's like growing up in New York in his area and stuff like that. So we're going to let him go into that a little bit. Yeah, so um, I'm from Brooklyn, Williamsburg, South Side. Um, not really repping it, I'm just saying that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, when I was growing up, um, it was cool. It was you know, a lot of Spanish people around me. I knew I always hung, hung around um, colored I was with, with what we, you know, African American. I was never with the Spanish crowd in school. Um, middle school, it kind of got a little crazy because I was I was around a lot of Italians, a lot of them, ninety percent of them, and um, it was you know, it was an experience. So. Um, so let's let's pause right here real quick. Yeah. So how did the Italians treat you? The Italians um, really embraced me. Um, a lot of females, you know, were kind of into me, or you know, they were, you know, we would mess around. We did, we did things, you know. They embraced me, you know. It wasn't just, and it was never like done some. They felt better, and I always felt like, you know, they wanted it, you know, you know. Um, but the white, the white Italians, the the males, the, the male Italians, they they embra they embraced me on some. Also, like they really, they, they felt like we were brothers. Like I, I could hang out in the house, you know. I could go into the house, even though they obviously lived in a little better house than I did. It was in a house I lived in the fifth floor in the south side. So, you know, um, I had friends who would tell me, you know, Italian friends who would tell me, yo, we can go to Italy on a summer trip, you know, and just be in the house by ourselves, you know. Um, and the other side, when I was going back home, um, you know, my we wasn't really well off. You know, uh, we wasn't. You know, I, I didn't have. I didn't have the nicest thing. You know, till I started making my own money, um, which is really young, it's fifteen. But um, yeah, growing up, we didn't. You know, I remember one of my last gifts was a Game Boy Color when the Game Boy Advance was already out. So yeah, <laughs> that was cool. But um, you know, we didn't really. My father didn't really buy us. You know, he didn't. He didn't. His money went into feeding us and keeping a roof over our heads and a way to get to school and get home safely and all that. Right. So, um, yeah, my father was, you know, kind of straight. My mother was, you know, she was, she she felt, me and her were always connected. Like, she looks, actually, I didn't even tell you this before any of this. Um, me and my mom, if you see me and my mom together, you think we're twins. Well, we look, she's just a female. She's just my mom. But we look exactly the same. Um, and it's, you know, so that's how, you know, I grew up in a house like that. And my sister is um, my father's complexion. She's very light-skinned, but she has dark skin, you know, dark hair. But she, she's white. She looks like a Caucasian girl. Right. Um, and I was, I was hanging out in the parks and hanging out in the hoods with my friends that weren't, weren't from school. And, you know, most embraced me. You know, I always had fun with a lot of people. I always, always had fun playing basketball. I always, 
I always played basketball in, in Brooklyn. Right, know? right. It's courts everywhere. Um, you know, I was um, I always was embraced with. I love the hip hop culture. I can like I grew up, you know, listening on everything that you so, can, anything you can think of. Like, so let me ask you this: So would you say that the North American Moors embraced you the most out of everyone? Yes, the North Americans embra- definitely embraced me more than like the. Um, like if you was if you if we if you knew if we knew you was from in New York if I knew you was from Africa like you was from over there like you came from over there you didn't really wanna um you didn't wanna and not no, that's not what I'm saying I'm sorry I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. yeah I mean yes you know. I'm sorry um the 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 Africans the, the African Americans that were here right they felt they felt like I was trying to just fit in. Like I wanted to be something, mm-hmm. something else, mm. which and then on the other side, Spanish people were like, "Nah, he really is like, he really act, he he acts like he acts like one of you guys. Like we don't want to act like that." Right. But it was the same thing. They were just doing it in Spanish. You know, they were just doing it in Spanish. Exactly. It's, the, it's just differences. It's in Spanish. That's right. really the only difference. They drink. They smoke. You know, make you know. They do whatever. They do everything that I grew up doing. They just do it. So. Now, let me ask you this. So, let's say that all the so-called black people in New York, let's say that all the so-called black people who speak English spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. Would it be any different than the Dominican Republic? I think what I think what the the, I think what it is, is my complexion. Mm. That's what I think. So, go go into the colorism. Because I'm not not like people say I'm yellow. You know, I'm not like brown. I'm like a little. So they ch- they challenge your black. Yeah, basically. they challenge. Yeah, they challenge like Yo, you're not really black. Like right. But then I'm like, but my hair's you know it's not it's nappy. Like you know, right, I, right. I have nappy hair. Like I have the same hair as you. You know. I, right. I'm you know, I don't look Caucasian. You know. Right. <laughs> I don't want to think. I don't want to look in the mirror and think I'm Caucasian. You know. I'm a right. Little, I'm a little okay. colored. So what we're gonna do now is is I want you to talk about. Um, how it is in the Dominican Republic as far as um, just how the, you know, the Moors down there live, the dark, the, the dark people, um, how their mentality is, what they think about, you know, the aboriginal so-called, you know, African-American or Moors that's in North America. Um, and just, you know, how the women are, in the, you know, down there, all that. Just go into okay. that real quick. So, yeah, um, Dominicans who come to America usually come to New York. Where it's put down, like they're gonna live in the hood. You know, they come from a poor country. They're gonna live in the project. Like I lived in the projects for a couple of years. You know, I was young. I was five when I left the projects. But I remember I have memories of the projects, gunshots, all that. Next door neighbors, gunshots. And I went to school, and my elementary school was ninety nine percent colored people. Like I was the I was the favorite. I was the lightest skin stu- kid in the whole building. Not the principal. I was the lightest skin. In the school, and I and I felt, I felt good. Like I felt like I knew who, like I knew who I was. Like I fit in. Like nobody in elementary school, you know, you're still young, so yeah. you know, you know. But um, the the family who I have, all my family really comes from the island. So when they come here and they listen to them, every they they see everything that's happening, the music, and they feel like. I don't want to say better. I don't want to say like they, they feel better because that's going. I don't want to do that. But um, that they feel like the way um, Black Americans live in New York or you know Black Americans live mm-hmm. is not a lifestyle or a culture that they want to live. Right. In reality, our culture is nearly identical to to so called Black American culture. Okay, so now now go into how the Dominican culture. Is similar to the so-called Black American culture. Yeah, so um, reggaeton came from Dominican Republic. I just want to say that the producers, most of the writers, um, went to Jamaica, went to where the reggae was really good. They, you know, they smoked a lot of weed with these guys. They came back to the country to come back to the Dominican Republic, and they brought that vibe. The problem was, was at that time it was really hard. It was not really hard, but it was there was it wasn't like these people. They didn't really have that much money. Or they didn't have visas. They didn't have people connections to America, so they can never pop off in America. So what do you do if you can't come to America, but you want to? You making good music, 
we go to the Puerto Ricans. Now, I don't want to discredit Puerto Ricans. They did, they do have a lot of artists, and you know, they do have their own music and everything. But reggaeton was were original. The most of the most of the original producers of that were basically Dominicans who embraced. Caribbean culture, you know, black culture, who, right. like, most black Americans in New York are Jamaican. Like, Jamaican, there are a lot of Jamaicans mm. in New York, you feel me? So, there's a lot of West Indian people in, in New York, right? From that, from that, from that area right there, Guyanese, all that. Mm -hmm. So, I always felt embraced by those people more. Like, the West Indians, I've dated, like, I've, I've known, I've been cool with more West Indians than at, like African Americans who are from here, like right. So like the islands, they treat me like I'm one of like they know, yeah, like you cool, man, you right. cool, like. And tell me about um, we was talking about the strip clubs, real quick. Oh yeah, and the, so in the American public, the strip clubs, as you you probably will know, is full of colored women. Like colored women are, you know, different shades, you know, and. It's a, it's a, in the American public, that's a thing. Like, people want to go and see, not, they don't want to just go and see Caucasian women. They want to see some, some colors, man. Right? But at the same time, they, some, not all, you know, it's never all, it's always just most or some, think and feel like they shouldn't be able to have families with these colored women. Like, that should just be fair game, you know, whatever. And that's not, you know, that's just men stuff. But, um, you know, the strip clubs in the American Republic, the culture in the American Republic is just, it's just, it's black. Like, it's black America. It's, mm -hmm. it's black, it's whatever you want to call it, black American. I f like, even the wild, even when you go to the countryside in the American Republic, I feel like I could be, this could be in, like, in the mm -hmm. motherland. I could, I could be in Africa. It feels like it's nature. It's like, I see animals. It's not like, you know, Amer like North America where, you might you have to go certain places to see. Mm -hmm. No, everywhere in New York, you could be in the city and you will run into an animal. Like not every day. You feel me? It's a little more controlled. So, so now I want to kind of go into this and kind of clarify something because um, you know this this man here um is is been out here and you know and been traveling from multiple places and he kind of knows what's going on. Um, previously, Blackbeard made a tape dealing with um how some of these Instagram models are traveling around the world and doing these you know, obscene acts for um, salaries. We're going to let him briefly go into what he knows about that and also um, another little island around Dubai that, that most of us may have not ever heard of. Yeah, so um, on the little island with the females, I've, um, I, I know I've read, I've read about it and I've read multiple, you know, sources who, you know, I just can't remember. I'm pretty zoned out right now. But, um, um, I feel like they were speaking some truth. They they spoke the truth. They 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 exposed something that was real. And then um, I want to speak about the little island. It's a bunch of females who they don't. They're married to their men. They're rich as they're rich as shit, and they don't want to have sex with their men. They want to have sex with foreigners. Anybody who is not from their country, from that island or from that you know part of the island, you know. But that part of the country, it is an island or a country. I don't remember exactly, but I know that I read about this. You know, right. but um, yeah. So women, so women are doing this, you know, to men. But also in Dubai, women are really just going over there to, you know, mess to do whatever these rich ass men who have been there for years, who just own everything, like they have really a lot of money, and you know, they're not really trying to be exposed. They're just trying to be out here doing what they do in their town, in their home. Um, they do a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know if you want to get into everything. But no, yeah, yeah. Like, on, on this page, I've been oh, going in. Like the, graphic, like, the graphic shit. Okay, well, like the graphic shit. so, this, you know, I've never been to Dubai. <laughs> I've never been with a girl who's been to Dubai, but the stories are females get paid a lot of money where you can go on vacation to Dubai and you can get, you do whatever this, these men tell you to do. If they want you to eat shit, you eat shit. For, 50, for whatever money they tell you to eat, like, you just do it. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing. Like, it was a thing. I don't know if it's really still going on. I haven't really seen it on Instagram a lot lately. But, again, I'm not in all that social media shit. So, I don't really, you know, I'm not right. into it. I don't really care. So, um, yeah, so that's, you know, a couple years ago, those were the stories that were going around, and it was a real, like, fun fact. Like, it was, like, a fact that you were like, nah, I don't want to believe it, but it was, like, 
everybody was running, everybody knew this and was saying this out loud, like, this was happening, like, we knew females was going to Dubai, and to these, uh, these places over there, and getting paid off, and coming back home, and you see them, and they have a brand new house, car, and it's just because they just went home, they just went away for, for a week, mm-hmm. and did what, whatever the man with the power told them to do, and that's, that's something that goes on. I, I, I hope it's not still going on, but it's probably yeah, going it's, on years. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's probably didn't just start. You know, nah, nah, so. yeah, it's still, it's still popping pretty strong. Oh you yeah, know, you, you've heard, you've been hearing stories. Yeah, I have, because um, yeah. you know, here we, um, we in, in the Mirage universe, we know about um, a phenomenon and a certain archetypal creature called the Negro bed stench and. You know, it's just on Instagram and social media. We know this stuff is going on, and a lot of these women are flexing and, mm-hmm. and, and trying to make it seem like they these bad bitches and X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z when they really are eating um, doo doo Twinkies and shit like that. <laughs> so what we're gonna do now is, is we're gonna let the uh, man transition into some of the hypocrisy a little bit because he kind of brought us into how at the strip clubs down in the Dominican, you know, you, you have the, the colored women in the clubs and stuff like that. And um, the men are going in there and they're thinking that, okay, I can have their little sexual escapades and everything's cool, but may not necessarily want to start a family with these people, uh, may not want to date these people, etc. So kind of go into, you know, the hypocrisy that you see in the so-called Spanish Central and South Americas between, um, you know, we'll say the Caucasian Spanish speaking people and the dark skinned female. Okay, so yeah, um. So, like I said, my father is a blonde man with blue eyes, and my mom is probably a shade or two more than me, darker than me, so she is of color. Um, and he once told me, I, I won't get into that, he once told me that he didn't want me to date or be in a relationship family-wise with a female who was my mom's complexion or darker. and. Um, I almost got physical with him because that's, you know, don't disrespect my, you, had, you had kids with my mother, so, you know, you know don't be a hypocrite, that's a hypocrisy, that's, that's called being a hypocrite. Um, and we just, we, me and my father never really connected, like, um, who knows why, maybe we, we just think differently, you know, I'm more, I'm more, I, I feel like I'm more in tune with myself, you know, I don't want to say that, but, you know, more than yeah, me, yeah. maybe a little. Um, but he... He he didn't want to embrace that, whether he wanted it or not. He wanted, some way or another, to be a part of that, whether it was in Spanish or was it in English or it was in some native language in Africa. He felt at a certain point he felt like he would have a family with a colored woman because he did. He had two kids, so. So let me ask you this: Why do you think you're a Caucasian? Archetype father felt like he was gonna have a child with a colored woman. Um, maybe maybe he was in love. You know, I don't know. Maybe he really loved and he, you know, all that. But um, he grew up and he didn't really know. He was he didn't meet a black person to his preteens, a colored person to his a dark skinned colored person to his preteens. He might have seen like a little Indian, little Indian color, you know. Brown, you know, like, like you said, bronze, like you right, know, yeah, copper, bronze color, copper, copper color, yeah. right? Um, but nothing, nothing too, nothing too dark. And when he did, it was like you know they were hard workers, like you know it felt like growing up, going back to the American public and seeing these things. I can always connect to when I was in school and they would tell us about the slaves, like that they had brought from Africa, you know, allegedly, you know, allegedly, you mm-hmm. know. Um, yeah, which is, you know, and so I always could connect those things, you know, like, I always felt like that's what was going like, that's what happened in my country, like, my country, um, the American public, you know, they, they were more there. Right, right, right. Um, Haiti is our neighbor, if you go to Haiti, there's, there's Moors everywhere, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's a more island, you know. Right. Um. Obviously, you know, the, the Europeans came in, and that's how my father f- was a little, I don't know, he was disconnected, with, he's disconnected with the culture, like, he, my father grew up a Catholic. Exactly. So, my father, my all my father knew was work, like, my father knew, all my father knew was serious, and like, as, as far as I can tell, you know, 
what he always taught us was that he was always taught you got to get your own you can't depend on nothing and you know you feel me like so whatever okay you do is you know so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have about we're gonna have about seven or eight more minutes what i want you to do now is is kind of we're gonna wrap this thing up with okay. Um, the drastic level of the hypocrisy because you have a lot of dark female, dark skin or dark colored females out here mm -hmm. that, that have a movement and they're calling themselves so-called swirling, which is chasing after men who are not dark colored men. And they think that these men of other ethnicities really like them. So go into a story of some of the hypocrisy um, that really exists out here. I'm talking about the as far as with these the, the 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 not wanting you to be with dark skinned women. Oh, okay, so um, when now when I really started like dating girls, like it was like we was dating. I was dating colored women, right? dark dark skinned women, every right? dark skinned women, girls, you know, ladies. Um, and when my family found out about it, back my parents kind of like didn't really make a scene because we was out here and you know in, in New York, I grew you know, in Brooklyn. But when we met at the island, you know, the jokes were flying, like, you know, disrespect, you know. And they would always clown me because, you know, I said, you know, I dated black women. And I actually liked black black women. Like, and I was like, how do you not, like, I was getting this, I was getting these type of comments from men, men talking to me. Like, why are you dating a black woman? And it took one uncle of mine to tell the, to tell everybody in the family that yo like he colored a woman and he was a fair skinned man he's not he you couldn't tell he was Caucasian or or colored like he was like a Spanish regular Spanish looking man Span like Spanish mm -hmm. ball. <laughs> and um he he said he said all out to everybody that he respects like he he knows exactly where I'm coming from he knows exactly how I feel he knows he knows that dark skinned woman are not a bad thing. Like, you know, they want to make it seem like. Yeah, so it's basically it's, it's like they want to make it seem like, um, you know, just dating dark skinned women is a bad thing. Yeah, like um, the jokes are always flying in my opinion. Like, you know, they always. That swirling is a bad thing. Yeah, um, they always, and they always try to make it seem like, you know, she was just trying to have a lighter skinned baby. I'm like, why? That she's just, oh, so, so. Yeah. So they used to say that, oh, yeah, the dark skinned one, woman was, was, just wants to have a lighter skin. Yeah, oh, so was, the main yeah. joke here is, is that the dark skinned woman wants to have a lighter skinned baby with good hair and green eyes, right? Yeah, but, um, I'm not none of that. <laughs> but you want to know the truth to this reality? Yeah. There is a group of women on the computer and the internet and on YouTube right now that call themselves, like I said, swirling. Okay. And guess what their whole movement is about? That's that's a whole movement. Getting a baby with good okay, hair a, and green eyes. But that's that's a trap. That's different. Like they're trap. They're doing it on purpose. It's not like they're really loving these men. Well, oh, really? That's kind of like... I no, you're that's right. That's what like the this difference is. You're like right. This, because they're not doing it for the love. They're doing it for the for Just bag. for the baby, they're huh? They're doing it for the baby and for the bag. Like The baby and the bag. The baby, the bag comes with the baby. If you have, Oh, wow. The bag comes with the baby. Du the double B. <laughs> Word. Like, not a, not a not double, double F. Not a, yeah, not a double D. I'm not, she, oh, don't, not, she don't no, wear a double nah. D. She wear she a double B. See, we don't need double Ds anymore. <laughs> the baby in the bag. Word. So that so that's interesting. So your so your family basically is the main joke is that yeah. they just want that kid. Yeah, that's that's and, really and we wonder why they would think that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I know exactly why, but uh, we ain't gonna even go into it. Yeah, <laughs> so to wrap it up, um, we're gonna talk about now. Basically. What would be your advice to people out there who are so-called mixed or mulatto and they feel like they're being torn between their Caucasian and their Moorish side? Um, what would you tell them? Um, 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 really? I haven't figured it out. You feel me? I'm still living and I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I'm about this. You know, like, I, you never want to disconnect from the family. But, you know, there's always, you always got to go through some hurdles, you know. Um, but... My advice would be just stay true to yourself. If you feel like you're more, if you feel more connected to your more side and feel more connected to your more side, and if you feel Caucasian, maybe you should read up on yourself. Maybe you should look into it. But you know, um, we're just here trying to lighten everybody. And then, and then we're gonna wrap it up with this. 
<laughs> so how do you look at these dark skinned Moors who speak Spanish, mm-hmm. but they think that they are Caucasian? Oh, they they're stupid. I I like I've gone into altercations about this. You know, like I've had arguments. You know, in the Dominican Republic, fights, physical. Like I've getting physical because. A men, men darker than me, you know, I'm not dark, but if you're darker than me, then you're more connected to the Moors than I, you know, right. you, you know, you know, it's stronger in you. So how can you deny where you come from because you want to be accepted by somebody who doesn't want to accept you? Like right. corner stores in New York City are run by Dominicans. And guess what? The city doesn't fuck with you. I know it's hard to understand that, but... The, the city doesn't care about bodegas in New York City. They don't. They don't. You feel me? Like they right. just want to take all your money in taxes. My father owned a business, so I know a little bit about that. And so, so to and that. so to wrap this up too, tell let's tell us what your father said about having businesses in the so called black community. Oh, okay. So my father, my father had we opened up um, a bodega, um, Michael Max, you know, Bushwick Best Eye, right in the middle of Broadway. Um, and we, they purposely, like, they purposely looked for a bodega that they can open up that is in the hood near the projects and near, you know, more colored people because it's a fact and it is known that colored people spend more money on the community. What, whether it's, it should be more, more community, more, more, you know, businesses involved, but you know. They wherever they're at, that's where they're spending money at the bodegas, the liquor stores, Chinese food, you know, exactly. all that. That's, everybody but their own shit. Yeah, everybody exactly. That's that's the fucked up part about it. But the you know, but they do spend it in their community. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's the wrong community, but you know. right. I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> right. And he would say that you know they had you know he had hope that they could get a bodega or a corner store. You want to you want to call it a deli, mm. um, where it was more prominently white. But the problem with that is you have to overcharge and you still have um, colored people in the neighborhoods because they're still there. They're not just gone. You know, right. They're still there. Um, but they can't afford your overpriced things because the white man is going to pay for it. But the white man only comes in once an hour. Right. You know, you might see three white men in an hour go into a deli. Like, white men don't spend their money in delis. They spend money in their businesses and their friends' restaurants. And that's it. They don't. They're not spending money on bodegas. Right. No. <laughs> and see, so there y'all have it. Um, just Aboriginal North American Moors not spending money in their own community. Um, just a sad usual. Yeah. And also too to wrap it up, you know, I'm very very glad this man went into it because he basically just told a lot of these dark skinned women out here that these men really ain't checking for y'all like y'all think. <laughs> and they're onto your game about you wanting yeah. just a baby with yeah. good eyes and um. Good hair. Yeah. It's the boy Blackbeard Mirage, man. Y'all stay tuned for the next one. I'm out.